and Japan, and a very good afternoon to United Kingdom. Hope everyone is safe during this pandemic. I am Ishika Mohunraj, a final year BCom student of Sheshad Ripuram Evening Degree College. Welcome to the 51st international webinar of Sheshad Ripuram Evening Degree College. At the outset, I am happy to inform you all that our Evening Degree College is celebrating its Golden Jubilee year. On behalf of our college, we congratulate all the stakeholders. Today's webinar is completely hosted by the students of Sheshad Ripuram Evening Degree College. Therefore, I request everyone to kindly pardon us in case of any mistakes. Department of English in association with King's College London, UK, and International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo, Japan, is organizing this international webinar on Digital Humanities Session 12. Now, I request Naga Siddha Ma'am, Assistant Professor, Department of Commerce, to play a small video of our college. Over to you, Ma'am. A great journey begins with a small step. Proving this statement true, it all began in 1930, when two women, educational enthusiasts, took up a noble initiative. In the earth's wild, posh locality of Sheshadripuram, Srimati Anandama and Srimati Sitamma started a primary school with 20 children. Now, Shashadripuram Educational Trust under its umbrella has 36 institutions. It all began with the educational visionary Sri K.M. Nanjappa, the then president of Shashadripuram Educational Trust. In 1971, which has been a landmark in the history of education for the working students by starting Sheshadripuram Evening College. Our college started with the primary objective of imparting formal education to the quality and needy. The college is affiliated to the Bengaluru Central University. Being in the heart of the city, it has an easy reach and connectivity. Its premises comprise of spacious building with good canteen, computerized library, business lab, browsing center, Wi-Fi facility, sports club, thus well equipped for all academic, sports, co-curricular like NSS, NCC, YRC, etc. and extracurricular activities throughout the year. The college organizes orientation program for freshers and guest lecturers to equip them. As most of us are working in the morning and studying in an evening degree college, it is very facilitative for us to excel in our jobs. Even though we are studying in an evening degree college, we are being provided many state level and national level opportunities to express our talents. Also, many cultural activities are being conducted. SEDC is engaged in various cultural activities throughout the year. There are numerous committees in the college that perform variedly on their behalf and have a lasting effect on the college, students as well as outsiders. Our evening degree college believes in the vision to ignite the minds of every student to identify and develop their inner strength with the mission to promote holistic development of students by offering quality education and making them self-reliant and progressive. Our college NCC cadets will visit every academic year in Officers Training Academy Chennai, the INS Kadamba Naval Base at Karwar. It will motivate our college NCC cadets to join Indian Armed Force. Thank you, Nagasudha ma'am. I now request Sri Rantani of third year BCom to welcome and introduce all the dignitaries to this international webinar. Over to you, Sri Rantani. Happy evening to India and Tokyo and a very good day. Sri Rantani, a final year BCom student, will take this opportunity to welcome you all to this 51st international webinar of our college. At the outset, I would like to thank all the office bearers of this great institution and welcome all of them. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome today's first theme speaker, 
Dr. Ariana Kula, Deputy Director and Senior Analyst, King's Digital Laboratory, King's College, London, UK. Ariana is Deputy Director and Senior Research Software Analyst at King's Digital Lab. She has broad experience in digital humanities research and teaching, research management, and digital research infrastructures. She holds a PhD in manuscript and book studies, an MA in applied computing in humanities, and a BA honors in communication sciences. She worked at the Kings in the past as a research associate. From 2009 to 2012, she worked as a science officer at the facilitator at the University of Roehampton for three years. Her personal research interests focus on the modeling of scholarly digital resources related to primary sources. She lectured and published on humanities computing, in particular on digital manuscript studies and editing. She has organized conferences and workshops in digital humanities and is an active member in its international. Ma'am, on behalf of Shri Shadripuram Educational Trust, I wholeheartedly welcome you to this webinar. Now, I would like to introduce and welcome today's second theme speaker, Dr. Kyonari Nagasaki, Senior Fellow, International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo, Japan. Nagasaki is, uh, holds a PhD and is a senior fellow at the International Institute for Digital Humanities in Tokyo. His main research interests in the development for development of digital frameworks for collaboration in Buddhist studies. He is also engaging in investigation into the significance of digital methodology in humanities and in promotion of digital humanities activities in Japan. He has been participating in a number of digital humanity projects conducted at several institutions in Japan and abroad, such as University of Tokyo, Kyoto University, Osaka University, the National Diet Library, and University of Hamburg. His activities also include post-graduation education in digital humanities at the University of Tokyo, as well as an administrative task at the several scholarly society, including Japanese Association for Digital Humanities, Japanese Association for Indian and Buddhist Studies and Alliance of Digital Humanities Organization. He is also engaged in international standards such as ISO, IEC, TEI, Consortium, and IIIF. So that East Asian digital humanities will be viable globally. His numerous publications on digital Buddhist studies and digital humanities are almost written in Japanese but several papers and chapters are available in English. Context of digital humanities in Japan in digital humanities and scholarly research trends in Asia Pacific towards a digital research environment for Buddhist studies in literary and linguistic computing. So on behalf of Shishadri Purim Educational Trust, I will heartily welcome you to this webinar. I would also like to welcome our beloved principal, Professor Enes Sati, sir, who is the man of perfection and guiding force for organizing 50 international webinars conducted so far. So I will heartily welcome you to this webinar. I welcome all the office bearers and trustees of Shishadripuram Educational Trust and all principals of our sister institutions, other heads of institutions, conveners, volunteers, and all participants who have registered across the globe. Now I welcome Dharepa Konur, sir, Program Coordinator and Rajat PS sir, IQAC Coordinator. And finally, I welcome teaching and administrative staff to this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Ranjani. May I now request our first theme speaker, Dr. Ariana Chula, Deputy Director and Senior Analyst, King's Digital Laboratory, King's College, London, UK, to enlighten us on the topic, Overview of King's Digital Lab. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me and for giving me the possibility to present some of the um, dimensions of the place where I work. So I'm going to try and share my screen now. Um, I hope you can see my slides. If I can get any thumbs up, that would be useful. Oh, ma'am, white uh, sheet here, only blank white. Can you see now? 
No ma'am. No? No ma'am. Yeah. Let me try again then. We tried before and it worked. But sometimes. Yes, ma'am, we can see. Yes, you can see now, yeah. great. Um, so um, rather than talking too much about my own research and my own project, I thought it was going to be useful um, to present uh, the place where I work in Digital Lab and how it, it is structured. Um, so giving you an overview of, of the place um, and of the lab, sorry. Um, so the first, um, sorry. Um, I, as, um, apology. As uh, I was presented, so I'm deputy director of the lab and I'm also um, in my main role as senior research software analyst. So I hope to explain a little bit more about these roles um, later on, but um, quickly, maybe first few words about digital humanities at King's College London. You probably know that um, there is a long history of digital humanities at King's spanning over 30 years of activities. Um, so there, there was quite a lot of pioneering work going on already um, in the 1970s and then onwards through the 90s uh, when the Center for Computing in the Humanities was established and directed by Professor Harold Short in 1991. And in 2008, um, the Center for E-Research was um, uh, with the director of Professor Sheila Anderson. Um, and in 2011, it was decided that these um, uh, resources really should be um, merged together into the Department of Digital Humanities, which is still very active today um, with five master's degrees, um, including one indeed in digital humanities, a one undergraduate degree, PhD program, and over um, 60 members of staff. So the department is still there, and I, I encourage you to look it up um, on, the, on the college website. Um, in 2015, it was decided that the development arm of the department should have a separate home, if you like, a separate research facility um, to um, keep some of the development staff but also to to expand it and um, so now we are in king's digital lab we are um, 13 uh, permanent member of staffs and our roles are modeled around the research software engineering role so we have project managers uh, analysts like me uh, software engineers um, ui ux designers system managers and then in addition to the core team obviously we have um, visiting fellows research affiliates or research assistants on several projects we have quite robust um, technical infrastructure that supports our activities, um, which is now moving towards a more open stack in collaboration with the college e-research unit. Um, we, the, the, the lab was created at the time I wasn't there, but it was created because the volume um, of projects that were managed by the department was quite um, substantial. So when the lab started and through the, the five years of operation, we managed around 160 digital projects, um, including indeed a, 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 about 100 that we inherited from the previous year of activities that I mentioned before. So you can guess um, that this is not really um, a small uh, endeavor. We are supported by external funding, so by research grants that come from different funders, but we are underwritten internally, which means that the college and in particular the Faculty of Arts and Humanities supports um, our cost, so part of our cost. Um, so this is a diagram that explains a little bit how we are structured. So we are, as I said, the King's Digital Lab is within the Faculty of Arts and Humanities, and in actual fact, it behaves like any other departments, but obviously because of the, the work we do, uh, we, we collaborate with several, with many departments within the faculty. So history, classics, uh, French, German, um, and obviously digital humanities itself with which we have a, a privileged relationship because of our history and the, the things we do. Um, so what, what do we do on our day-to-day -day basis? The majority of our time is spent in development of collaborative research proposals and projects. And the projects are of different nature from um, uh, data collections, digital resources of different kind, tools, um, data analysis and visualizations, and also increasingly uh, immersive experiences, augmented reality or artificial intelligence and machine learning experiments. That's basically the core of our activity. We also do some consultancy on specific digital methods and technology or writing research grants applications, as I mentioned before. We care a lot about sustainability, so that's core to our values, but also to our operations, uh, as I hope will became also clear um, some of our resources that I shared. 
Um, as I said, we do have our own infrastructure, but some elements of that infrastructure also shared obviously across projects and um, used by others in some cases. We run events, internships, workshops, and occasional training or teaching like now. Um, and each of us has 10% of the time to experiment on some areas of um, development, design, analysis, research that they like to know more about that might be risky and hasn't yet developed into a full, full project, but it could in the future. Um, so on our website, you can find uh, information about um, the type of project we engage with. And these range from, if you like, more traditional humanities computing projects, such as, for example, historical databases, or prosopography, digital scholarly editions of medieval manuscripts, to, as I said, um, more experimental digital creativity uh, projects. So there are, there are different things that we do. And um, obviously, we collaborate outside the college as well with other universities, um, uh, research institutes, uh, museums, galleries, archives, and, and the funders are also different, national and international. Um, so in a, in a forthcoming paper, the director of the lab, James Meathies, and myself tried to, to analyze the lab from different lenses and dimensions. And we claim that the, um, the challenge in the lab is to, to make these four dimensions interact optimally. And the four dimensions are obviously at the core, the team, so the people, the data that we work with, um, the models that we produce, and the systems. I'm not going to say too much about the system, but if there are any questions, I can say more later. But I think it's important to acknowledge that there are different layers of the systems that we we use and we work with from the, the ones that are under our control. So as a lab, for example, our technical stack, the kind of um, programming language we use and so on, to the institutional systems um, that we, we need to use or interface with at the college level to obviously the external system, so external vendors or cloud storage or you name it. Um, but as I said, I want to focus a little bit more on the team and the roles because I hope it might be useful um, for others as well. Um, so as I said that we have a team of 13 people and our roles are um, defined within the label of research software engineer, which I'm pretty sure in your context is, is well known and probably uh, better adopted than in some other part of the world. Um, so we, these roles are mapped to best practices in industry. Again, probably some of you know about the Agile DSDM, um, Agile Business Consortium um, project framework. Um, so the, the research contest we operate with is obviously an adaptation of that framework. So those roles are, um, have been developed and, and put together with the research context that we operate in mind and, and with human resources and so on. And so again, later I have a, a, my last slide, there are some references if you're interested to look more at the H role and what it entails. Uh, but um, there is also a blog post on our site where our director explains um, how he sees the research software engineering uh, career um, span um, a range really of roles from the research support role, for example, system manager on the green um, uh, right side of the screen to the research active a postdoctoral research associate level. So it spans um, an important, quite a substantial range. And I would say that the, the majority of the team sits in the middle in that research intensive area. Um, but it, as you can see, it's considered separate from the IT business support that operates at the college level and has a, a different role. So we, we really interface with research on a day to day basis. Um, the way that we, we operate within the lab and how we manage our project is via, again, um, adapting um, Agile DSDM um, practices in terms of software development lifecycle. So this diagram um, uh, explains a little bit the flow across projects from an initial idea that might come, uh, for example, at an encounter at a conference uh, or a discussion, an email, a form that we have on our site all the way through the development of that project and then the post-project phase, which obviously entails maintenance and sometimes archiving or the commissioning of a project. Um, so I don't want to spend too many details here and we will find lots of information on our site about this, but I thought it's important to mention that each of these phases are accompanied by some documentation or some governance documents, again, following the Agile DSDM methodology from uh, terms of references at the beginning when we, when we discuss a project idea 
to the very important feasibility template where we assess the feasibility of a project based on the research context, the research questions, the methods, and very importantly, the requirements for that project, which, which are prioritized and also using some, uh, some techniques that are borrowed from Agile DSEM. Um, so that feasibility phase is very important for us to assess whether we can actually engage with that project even before we have the funding. And if we, uh, we consider that project viable, then we produce a more extensive product quote, which obviously includes the cost of our engagement with that project, but also a lot of other important information about the research context, the directions, the requirements, a draft of the solution architecture, um, technical considerations of several kinds, including forward planning for when the project will finish and about its, um, for example, its archiving. Um, another important template, especially from the analyst point of view, is the project review record that we, we, we use to basically track the evolutionary development of a project, its iteration, the decisions that are taken, the learning points, but also some of the artifacts that we produce, for example, in terms of design or data modeling. Um, so it can become a, a really long document, but it's really a live document that we use to meet with partners and to, to record decisions and actions and, and obviously interfaces also with project management. And last but not least, uh, especially when a project uh, results in a, for example, web resource that we host, we also produce a serv service level agreement with the partners so that there is clarity about the responsibility for hosting maintenance, especially after the funding finishes. Typically, our SLA lasts um, five years. Um, and I have here a link to a page on our um, GitHub um, uh, wiki where you can find all these templates. We, we shared all we could. Um, and it includes also guidance on the template. So you can actually have a look, adapt, and critique them. Maybe you have better templates um, or improve them, I don't know. Um, but it's useful. I think the, the, the document guidance is probably the, the most useful part because it gives an idea of the kind of questions that we, we ask ourselves and we ask our partner, for example, when we do requirement elicitation um, or other aspects of the project. Um, now, the, the methods around the, the way the lab uh, operates can be um, potentially divided into four. So the monitor methods, which are about the overall, if you like, management of the lab, the design methods that include the analysis and the building aspects, so the really um, the core, if you like, of, of what we do. And then there is the building methods themselves that are mainly um, uh, led by the research software engineers or the solution development team. Um, and then at the end of the post-project phase, there, there are the maintained methods that are usually led by system managers, for example. So you see, it, um, I hope, a little bit how the roles interact within this, um, within this cycle. Um, so just to give you an example, some of those monitor methods entails actually structuring our um, interactions and communication. So for example, we have daily stand up in the team where we, we say what we're going to do that day, whether we need other colleagues to work with us, whether something is blocking our work, to weekly meetings um, about project pipelines, so what's coming up. Um, are there any ideas that came our way and that we need to assess or does an analyst need to meet with a partner or there is, are there any issues? Uh, fortnightly time box meetings where we plan for every two weeks, we plan what, kind, what projects we're going to work on for that period. Um, monthly team meetings, which are obviously more about uh, HR issues or well-being or workload at the team level. And then every three months, we have quarterly time box meetings, which again, are the idea is to estimate what sort of project we're going to work on for the next three months. And, and as I said, typically, because we have that, that amount of project, we need to have some sort of projection and forecast about what project we're going to work on and whether they're going to be delivered on time or not. <laughs> Um, and so associated to, to, to these aspects of the, to these monitor methods of the lab, there are a set of tools that we use. So in our case, for example, with respect to task management, we use Active Collab to assign each other's issues to, or, or bugs or um, uh, requirements to address or increments to develop. We use Slack a lot for internal communication about projects, but also about the lab in general. And talking about interfacing with an institutional um, system, we use uh, Microsoft SharePoint as a 
if you like knowledge base or resource uh, for documentations around the projects. Um, and then obviously code repositories, we use GitHub. So you'll find on our GitHub repository, all the different um, projects that we work on with associated code, which is usually available under um, an open access license, MIT license, so for reuse. Um, I know that I don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to say that for me, the most interesting part of what we do is in that middle layer. So it's the interface between the system, the data and the team that happens in modeling exercises within the lab. And by modeling, I really mean I'm quite inclusive. So I'm not talking just about, for example, um, developing or working with computational models, but also defining um, the research space of a project in terms of units of analysis, for example, or definitions of certain um, humanistic areas of study or humanistic phenomena of study. Um, so they range from um, artifacts of different kinds that, that are produced in the project and life cycle. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go too much into detail on that, but I wanted to say that this is where the collaboration across the different roles is important. So typically, for example, an analyst might start by um, drafting or um, rephrasing important concept in a project. So say, for example, textual variant um, or um, uh, dynamic editing, what does it mean? So some, some of these, these concepts that might be crucial for a specific uh, digital project. And then those are discussed within the team and with partners to refine the space of the research and the methods. Um, and then typically, for example, the, the software engineer might on the other end develop a data model and that's also shared in different um, representational formats, for example, in an entity relations data model. Um, the UI UX designers on the other end might develop um, mockups for interactions across a certain resource or for um, collaborative editing workflow and so on. So modeling is really crucial to what we do and represents a lot of the type of work that we do. And we have ambitions to make our modeling process a little bit more transparent, more visible and, and really also uh, referable and reusable. Um, last but not least, I just want to say that in terms of the post project phase and what I said about sustainability, there is a page on our site that describes the approach that we take around archiving and sustainability and the options that we normally give to our partners in terms of what, what happens after the funding for a project finishes. Uh, so from, as I said, maintenance under a costed SLA to migration to a different home, um, to static conversion, uh, which is quite often enough to access an old project and still be able to see some of those um, resources. So data set deposit um, to minimal archiving and storage. And some of these are not exclusive options, but I thought it was useful to um, provide a list here and you can have a look um, on the site itself. Um, yeah, and this is then a, a list of references that I can, if useful, I can copy them um, in the chat um, later. This is it for me, thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insightful theme address. I now request our second theme speaker, Dr. Kiyonori Nagasaki, Senior Fellow, International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo, Japan, to enlighten us on the topic, Towards an Ecosystem for Buddhist Studies in the Digital Era. Over to you, sir. Uh, uh, can, can you see the slide? Yes, sir, we can see. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's my great pleasure to be invited to this Memorial International Webinar and to see such a, such a number of colleagues who are eager to study digital humanities in India. So today I'm going to talk about uh, what's an ecosystem for British studies in the digital era. I hope my talk will give you a perspective on digital humanities for Asian studies across East Asia and South Asia. So uh, today's agenda is here. So uh, I'll introduce the current situation of digital business studies. Then I will give an example of the attempt that is Buddhist Text Database Project, SAT. The, the SAT project have faced some issues regarding 
international standards such as character encoding and text encoding. That is ISO IC 10646 and text encoding initiative guidelines. In the last, I will give a conclusion. So as you know, Buddhism was originated in India in around the 5th century BCE and spread in two large language areas, Indic and Chinese in the Middle Age. The two language areas include various languages such as Pali and Gandhari in India and the Korean, Vietnamese and Japanese in China. So, so sorry. So as Buddhist scriptures were translated into various languages in the era, digital Buddhist studies must treat multilingual environments. So let me show the current situation of, of digital Buddhist studies in Prezi presentation. So um, I will change, um, change the... Um, Okay. okay, here, can you see the um, map? Okay? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Okay, thank you. So, so here's an image of a current situation of digital Buddhist studies. Each kind of digital contents and activities are integrated by digital creation and web collaboration operated by editors and collaborators who are consists of researchers and the public. Already several large series of digital, uh, uh, sorry, uh, several large series of text databases of Buddhist scriptures are published on the web by dissertation projects in Taiwan, United States, Korea, Thailand, and Japan. Then large canonical texts are available for Buddhist studies so far. Then uh, large uh, several digital dictionaries and lexicons are also available. The four websites are a part of them. They provide various convenience for digital Buddhist studies. Next. So some comprehensive freely available bibliographical databases are maintained in some project in, in Japan, Taiwan, and Germany. They give connection between digital resources and the research achievement. Then open access journals also connect the resources and achievement more directly. The number of the journals are not large so far, but expected to be larger due to the due to open access movement led by European Research Council and some funding agencies. Modern translations of scriptures will bridge between the classical text and the modern technologies of language processing, especially deep learning technology. The translations are gradually increasing now in English, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and so on. Image databases are recently available for consumer environment due to the development of computers and network bandwidth. The large number of cultural institutions releases their digital repositories, including digital images of Buddhist scriptures. The examples here are the examples are National Library of France. Uh, British Library and uh, National Diet Library in Japan. The di digital collections of Library of Congress also provide some Buddhist scriptures. Manipulation of digi digitized images on web 
recently become much convenient due to the IIIF, that is International Image Interoperability Framework, which are adopted by many cultural institutions. For example, the national libraries I mentioned above. One of the functions of the IIIF allows users to see digital images across multiple digital repositories. So, and one of the most important activities is standardization. Digital business studies at least the three standards that is Unicode, TI guidelines, and the IIIF. Uh, here's the, um, an example of a proposal for encoding characters. And uh, this is uh, the website of TI guideline or TI text encoding initiative. Then, so commercial contents are also important to be integrated into the ecosystem. The example, it's the Jap Japanese Commercial Digital Dictionary for British Studies. So, as I mentioned before, the digital contents and activities should be integrated by digital creation based on web collaboration by editors and the collaborators. Consists of not only researchers, but also the public in the context of open science and public humanities. But to evaluate the ecosystem, the activities and the results of digital British studies must be evaluated by the academic community in the field of British studies and digital humanities like this. So as you may know, um, um, alliance of digital humanities organizations are uh, so organizing the international so um so so internationally so local association of digital humanities now recently uh, in so so the association for uh, digital humanities in india also um, are about to involve to be involved so involved involved in the international association. So several large digital project projects are spread globally like this. Then let me um, return to the PowerPoint slide. Just wait. Yeah, okay. So I will introduce an example of the project for disability studies. SAT, SAT, we call it SAT. A Daizokyo Texo Database Project. It was established in 1994 and has been led by Professor Masahiro Shimoda in the University of Tokyo since 1999. He's a professor of Indian and Buddhist philosophy and the director of the Digital Humanities Initiative in the university. I'm working in this project as the technical manager and the developer. The SAT project released a Buddhist text database, including over 100 million Chinese, Japanese, and Indic characters on web in 2008, which was built in collaboration with over 200 researchers via web collaboration. After the releases, the project has continuously been 
improving the database in order to make a hub of international British digitization projects and services, such as electronic dictionaries, article databases, um, scripture databases, character databases, triple F images of digital facsimiles of manuscript and woodcut, woodcut printings of the scriptures, and TEI encourage modern translation in the context of open science and public humanities. So you can see most of the development of our project like this. So here, um, this is the main page, and uh, sorry, uh, this is the Japanese version. But the, this project also provides the um, English version. You can see the English version on the web. And then um, here's the, uh, the first version still available. And then the, the this version provides um, a kind of uh, dic dictionary lookup and uh, um, search function for bibliographic database um, uh, connected with the uh, text database. And the next version, uh, version um, 2015, it's also still available. So you uh, um, can see several data by selecting a word or a phrases. Then, so either can see related um, word, uh, meaning of word, and uh, the, the related bibliographical information like this. And uh, you can see uh, several um, data such as um, Uh, other related web resources and uh, parallel corpus in, um, in translation in English. Moreover, um, the SAT project also provides uh, image database like this. So this is a kind of Buddhist icons and user can search um, such with annotations attached to the to each image. And the user can see um, digital images um, so provided from various institutions on on this text database, um, version 2018. You can see uh, these images by click, by clicking these icons like this. So uh, during the improvement, the project faced many issues, especially on international standards. Then, and the project have addressed to solve some of them. So I would like to introduce two of them here. So character encoding and the text encoding. So um, there were over 6,000 characters which were not encoded in Unicode consists of many Chinese, some Indic and Japanese characters. So we de developed a character database and a display system uh, like, like, this, like this. Here is the, uh, here is a part of the database, uh, character database we developed. So, and we, so once we developed a kind of display and encoding system originally, but the system needs a special system for coding and displaying the group of the characters. So it then it was weak 
in the con context of interoperability and sustainability. So the project started to encode them in ISO IC1066 and Unicode. So the project participated in the committee for the international character encoding, IRG. Um, wait, back to the slide, okay. So, so in 2012, then, so the project become a liaison member of ISO, IAC, JTC1, SC2 to submit the proposals of Chinese character encoding officially. So as a result, some Indian characters has been included in Unicode in 90, uh, so, sorry, in in 2015 in version eight. The other characters are managed by, so, so uh, ISO IC, IEC, JTC1, SC2. Then encoding characters for academic use are generally supported by scripting encoding in initiative in Berkeley. So, the first 2,800 Chinese characters have done in 2017 in Unicode version 10. Then these around 3,000 additional characters have done in 2020. So in Unicode version 13. And then the project continued to continue for a uh, few thousand characters which remain now. So, and then, so, uh, and this slide uh, shows uh, part of a proposal of, so, a character encoding for for uh, so ISO IC. Then I'd like to introduce one more activity on international standards that is text encoding. Do you know TI text encoding initiative? So TEI, text encoding initiative guidelines were difficult to be adopted for Asian materials or, or general Asian materials because some semantics for Asian text were not included in the TEI guidelines. So um, there are very few examples for Asian text in the guideline that is the, it was difficult for encoders. Then the member of the SAT project started to disseminate the issues among the uh, DH researchers at the DH conference, DH humanities conferences, and the TEI membership. So, so, sorry, TEI members meeting that is among Western digital humanities people. As a result, the special interest group for East Asian Japanese texts was established. So after that, a special interest group for Indic text was also established immediately next year. So the, the special interest, interest group for East Asian Japanese has been promoting the guidelines in Japan. So then, so the, pro, the special interest group compared the Japanese TI guidelines for Japanese and East Asian classics and modern texts so far. And so developed uh, TI encoded text and visualization tools, discussing possible semantics and proposals in TI guidelines. So as a result of the activities, 
uh, Ruby related elements, uh, which occurs generally, generally in Japanese text, were implemented in uh, P5 version 4.2.0. So of TEI guidelines. So it denoted that a marginal textual tradition of a large cultural area can be included in the guidelines if necessary. So uh, here is the J J Japanese guidelines, sorry, written in Japanese like this. And this is the, the, just the guideline, gu guidelines for the Ruby annotations like this. So, um, there are some other international standards which are available for disability studies, but so, so, so far, I introduced two uh, examples. So past international standards were insufficient for British studies due to the technical limitations, such as slow computers and narrow bandwidths of network. So digital British studies recently have began to pay attention to international standards. According to the development of technical availabilities, international standards seem to ex expand their adoptable scope in general, especially scholarly context. Then digital British studies will continuously engage in international standards so that they can connect or bridge their activities in the ecosystem appropriately, globally, and sustainably. It will provide various opportunities, not on, only for British studies, but also for people who are interested in the Buddhist as one of the significant intellectual heritage. Thank you for your at attention. Thank you very much, sir, for your insightful theme address. Now, the floor is open for interaction. We will take up questions which we have received from the chat box and registration form. I request Vinay Sagar, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Commerce, to moderate the interaction session. Over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ishika. Uh, very good evening to the speakers. Uh, my first question is to Arina, ma'am. Ma'am, can I? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, ma'am, what kind of interdisciplinary support you expect to succeed in digital humanities? That's a big question. Um, I think, first of all, in terms of uh, interdisciplinarity itself, the core activity of the research software engineer is to work across disciplines anyway. So because we, as I mentioned before, we work on different projects at the same time, typically the role of the software engineer, whether it's a developer or an analyst or a designer, is to apply methods across a range of very different projects. So it could be, for example, indeed, um, say, uh, some aspect related to data modeling of text, textual variants, and it might be relevant for a project that has a very specific focus on, I don't know, medieval history of Scottish charters, I don't know. Uh, but at the same time, the methodology that are applied uh, and are used for that project are usually refashioned or re, re, readapted for other areas. It might be a totally different period. It might be a totally different type of text. But more often than not, the, the role of the, the research software engineer is to abstract out from those specificity and identify common methods that can then be refined um, in other cases. I hope that answers your questions. But there's obviously other kinds of interdisciplinary elements as well. But that's the core. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, one more question. Ma'am, what challenges have you faced to set up the best digital lab at King's College? 
I think that would be a question for the director more than me, but definitely um, there are several challenges. First of all, possibly the challenges, the challenge of making sure in the case of KDL that we were able to engage with new project and do experimentational research, innovative research, while at the same time also taking care of the legacy of all those um, resources that were built before KDL was established. And so there was a huge effort going into sustaining those resources and it's still ongoing in the background. So it will always be in a way our richness, it's why we're known, it's why the, the profile of the lab, it is what it is, but it's also a major challenging challenge to make sure that those resources are maintained or that they, have, they are taken care in such a way that, for example, others might, might then take them um, as part of their, their institutional legacy, their institutional portfolio of resources and so on. So I think that's one of the major challenges for sure. Um, other element concerns also um, uh, squaring the circle around different criteria via which our projects are supported. Um, so for example, having a funding strategy and specific KPIs um, to, to inform our, our choices and our work um, and really starting from scratch. So without having a lot of reference, especially in the digital humanities of so teams similar to ours. So we're, we're quite unique, although there are obviously uh, more and more larger laboratories in digital humanities. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, my next question to uh, Nagasaki, sir. Sir, can I? Uh, yes. Sir, what challenges have you faced while preparing a digital frameworks for collaboration in Buddhist studies? And what tools have helped you for this? Mm, so, um, mm, so, um, so the, the most, uh, most of it difficult to change was so uh, get, getting funding or a kind of budget problem. So, and then, um, and then so, so in, in the, so in, in my generation already, so uh, Buddhist scholars in, in my country um, already, so, 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 so already, uh, so some of the, them are engaging engaging in digital Buddhist studies. Then, so so uh, personally, I I I've not I've not not faced um, the large challenge, so difficult issues. But so general, the the general, um, so uh, the. the difficulties so the in international standards issue is so um di difficult and so it's um, um, partially the issues of po political um so po political aspect then so 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 it takes um so much time to to, to and so to treat um to to, to get uh, a kind of um, way to um to be involved in so activities of international standards so so and then so other issues are not not, not so so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, sorry, it, it, it um, So, is that your answer? Oh, okay, okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is all uh, from the Q and A session. Over to you, Ishika. Thank you very much, respected speakers, for answering the questions of the participants. And also thank you, Vinay Sagar, sir, for moderating the interaction session. A small announcement before moving forward. We will now send the feedback form link in the chat box, as well as to your registered email, which will be active for the next 48 hours. 
kindly fill the same and send back for e-certificates. The e-certificates will reach you within seven to 10 days. Very shortly, we will meet in one more international webinar of our evening college that is on 29th of this month. The topic is Digital Humanities, session 13, in association with Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago, Illinois, US, and North Carolina Central University, Dharam, US, and the Center for Studies in Social Science, Calcutta, India. Due to some technical issues, our honorary trustee, sir, Sri W.D. Ashok, sir, was unable to join today's international webinar. Moving ahead, I now request Sumukha of third year BCom to propose the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sumukha. Thank you, Ishika. A very good afternoon to London and a happy evening to Tokyo and India. Myself, Sumuka S., a final year BCom student of Sheshadipuram Evening Degree College. It is my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks on behalf of Sheshadipuram Evening Degree College on this occasion. At the outset, I thank King's College, London, UK, and the International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo, Japan, for associating with us to conduct this international webinar. I would like to express our sincere gratitude to team speaker, Dr. Ariana Chula, Deputy Director and Senior Analyst at the King's College, London, UK, for presenting a team talk on overview of King's Digital Lab. I'm humbled and grateful to you, ma'am. I would like to express our sincere thanks to team speaker, Dr. Kiyonori Nagasaki, Senior Fellow at the International Institute for Digital Humanities, Tokyo, Japan, for presenting an excellent team talk on towards an ecosystem for Buddhist studies in the digital era. Thank you, sir, for your valuable words. My special thanks to our beloved young and energetic principal, Professor N.S. Sati, sir, who is the robust of our Sheshadipuram Union Degree College. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank Dharapa Konur, Program Coordinator, Rajat B.S., Coordinator IQSC, who have helped us to materialize this webinar. I express our gratitude to all the principals, conveners, members of our sister institutions and other colleges, academicians, research scholars, students, and delegates across the globe for participating in this webinar. I would like to convey our heartfelt gratitude to Sheshadipuram Evening Degree College for giving us, the students, the special opportunity to host this international webinar. We will ever remain grateful to our teaching and administrative staff for their support. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Sumuka. Once again, thank you, one and all. Principal, sir, can we conclude the webinar? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for joining with us. Thank you. Thank you, Nagasaki, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Yes, sir.